Hallelujah. Packed out on a Monday night. It's not even Friday. When all the deacon boards come from the backslidden churches to see why there's so many people in the parking lot. How many of you are ready for God to do something great tonight? Can you say amen? Why don't you lift your hand wherever you're at, your hands to the Lord. Father, we thank you for what we're seeing all over the nation. You shaking this country one more time by your power. And I thank you for what we know in our spirits this week, that before we close out on Friday, there will be something drastic that happens for the good in the state of Alaska. In Jesus' name, we thank you for the drug supply pipelines being dried up from the root coming into this nation. We thank you that death is rebuked off of the young people of Alaska. We thank you in advance for revival in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you for and give you praise. And everybody said, give the Lord another great hand clap and you can be seated. If you're just joining us for the first time, we did four services yesterday, 9, 11, 1, and 6, and then uh, noon today, which there was just a little bit less than there was tonight, and then tonight packed out. So this is what you call revival meetings, which is kind of a lost thing. Everything's been replaced uh, with conferences where you have in multiple speakers, and it ends up being six guys in a canoe all rowing in their own direction because nobody stays for the whole conference. People just fly in for their night of speaking, do their thing, and leave. And so you get a zillion different doctrines, and it doesn't go anywhere. But revival will grow. In fact, take your Bible and open with me to Acts chapter 19. Acts, the 19th chapter. I'll just show you it in the Bible. In case you have family members ask you, when they said, where are you going tonight? You said, church. And they said, where'd you go yesterday two times? You said, church. And then they are concerned that you've joined a cult. But this used to be a common thing. My grandfather, when he got out of Bible college, uh, felt led to put up a tent in a town called Mount Morris, Pennsylvania, which is the last exit before you get to West Virginia, head, heading south out of Pennsylvania. So the town had 200. My grandfather took a church that had a few people in it and put a tent up and preached all summer from when school got out in June to when it started back up at the when it used to be the beginning of September. And they had 200 people in the town. They closed out the last few weeks, weeks of meetings with 800 people under the tent and 600 first-time decisions for Christ. All of the public school teachers saved. My dad got the baptism of the Holy Ghost in that meeting, and it was full of signs and wonders. There were three sisters that came up to receive Jesus Christ and got baptized in the Holy Ghost at the altar. But my grandfather said, told everyone to be quiet, told the musicians to be quiet, and he said, there's something very unusual happening. And he held the microphone up to the girls. Not only were they speaking in tongues, they were all speaking in the same tongue at the same time. So that's what the Bible calls signs and wonders. Where the Bible says in Mark 16, as they went and preached, the Lord worked with them, confirming what they said with many signs and wonders. If you're thankful you serve a living God, can you say amen? Then you see what the early church did, Acts chapter 19. The Bible says, Paul comes to this place called Ephesus, and in verse 8, then Paul went to the synagogue and preached boldly for the next three months. How long did he preach? Yeah, so you think a week's a long time. Preach boldly for the next three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some became stubborn rejecting his message and publicly speaking against the way. Talking about Jesus. So Paul left the synagogue and took the believers with him. Then he held daily discussions at the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for the next two years. How long? So now you're at two years, three months. And it said he began holding daily meetings for the next two years. So if you're not careful in the book of Acts, you start jumping around and you're going to read all the awesome things we're going to read at the end of this chapter and you think, well, how come that doesn't happen now? Well, it didn't just happen. He started preaching somewhere for three months. Half the place wanted him kicked out. So he just rents a different hall, takes the people that with him, starts from scratch, and continues to preach again. And after two years, it hits a point because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So the next two years, the people through the province of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. Then God gave Paul the power to perform unusual or special miracles, that when handkerchiefs or aprons that had merely touched his skin were placed on the sick, 
they were healed of their diseases and any evil spirits came out. And so, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not looking to like knock things, but you, you don't have that happen anymore. If you study American history, there were people, I'm not talking like recent, I'm not talking even Azusa Street, I'm talking 1700s, 1800s, where you had John Wesley with a horse in his 80s go preach 30 some different places in a week by horse. So these guys weren't holding a, an, an 85 minute service once a week and then a home group on another day. They were doing what the Bible calls laboring in the word of God. And so you can see what's happening here. We're only on night two. That when you let the word of God out, the Bible says that the word of God is seed and the word of God will never return void. And the Bible says what the job of a minister is. You know, if you talk, and I'm not, I'm not gearing this to people here. I'm sure it's people watching online. But I don't even think most people that are in the ministry know what the job of a minister is anymore. Because you tell them, what are you, uh, what, what's going on this week? Oh, I'm very busy. What are you doing? Well, we have to paint, uh, repaint one of the rooms. And then at my house, we're clearing about an acre of land because we want to turn it into yard. You don't read much of that in the book of Acts. That Paul took, Paul took three months off to clear an acre of property because his wife wanted to put a flower bed in. The Bible, Paul actually said, don't get entangled into the affairs of this world. Many of you that uh, know me because of online, you know, you, you follow everybody even when they're not around. I was only born not that long ago in the 80s, but I was even born long enough ago where having followers was a bad thing. Amen. <laughs> now people brag about how many followers they have. When I was a kid, if you had a follower, you had to go to the police and tell them to get the person to stop following. But, but many of you know, my wife and I just went through without question one of the, you know, the most difficult thing we've ever went through. And I, I, I was on the road back in my next meeting because I have what Paul had. My life is worth nothing if I don't preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Then he said in another place, woe unto me if I don't preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. You talk to preachers now. Hey, come to minister's conference with me. Oh, I, I can't. Uh, because I have to, have to what? You're a minister and there's a minister's conference. It's like your plumber calling you and saying, I can't fix the sink, you know, I've got other things to do. So people end up doing all the rudimentary things of the ministry without actually doing the ministry. But the Bible says, Jesus said, the sower sows the word. And they that are in the ministry are to labor in word and in doctrine. How many times did I preach yesterday? Four. Three, don't, don't short me one. Four. Three in the morning, one at night, and then two today, two tomorrow, and it's good for you. Actually, the more you do it, the stronger you get because it's what your job is. Right work, work never wore anybody out. Hard work never wore anybody out. Wrong work wears people out. I could preach for a month twice a day and feel like doing another month, but if I had to file my state taxes, I would need a nap after 25 minutes. You know what that lets me know? I'm not anointed to do that job. So God sent me a helper named Patrick from Germany who if he had to preach, he would be a nervous wreck. But if he had to sit down with the state IRS, he's at home because that's his job. So you let the Lord give you helpers to take the things off your plate so that you can labor in doing what a minister does, which is sow the word. Anybody, if you've ever seen, uh, I was going to say, has anybody ever seen Joel Osteen on television? But if you haven't, you're probably Amish because he's on TV a lot. Just a little anti-electricity joke there. If you've seen Joel Osteen, his father's name was John Osteen, who started that church from scratch. And a friend of mine uh, in the ministry would sit with him once a month, would fly to Houston to spend the day with him when John Osteen was, was in his 70s. And he said one day John Osteen was sitting behind his desk just studying. And I was with another great evangelist that's in his 80s. I had the chance to meet him a year ago this month. Same thing. Walked into his office. He had two Bibles open and a notepad writing. Looked up, spent 10 minutes with me. And when I left the room, he sat back down and kept studying. So he said John Osteen would be in there writing notes, studying the word, getting ready for Sunday. And he said one time his administrator came in with a notepad and said, Brother Osteen, you have to do this at 1 o'clock. And then at 2.30, this has to be done. And at 4 o'clock, this has to be done. And John Osteen looked up like only an old Texan can do and said, Remember this. All I have to do is get ready for Sunday. Please exit and shut the door on your way out. And he kept studying because really the way ministry works is it's about sheep and sheep feed on grass and sheep naturally feed where the grass is greenest. And the grass that you provide is the freshness of the word of God. You can download, I could have downloaded a sermon off sermoncentral.net tonight 
And you may have not known that I did that, but you'd have been able to tell something was up. But if a minister waits on the Lord and gets a direct word from God and then shows it to the people, it feeds the part of you that television can't fill, that parties can't fill, that friendship can't fill. That is your spirit, man, that longeth after the deep things of God. Can you say amen? Amen. And so the devil's strategy, if you read the book of Acts, the first way the devil tried to derail the early church was the Bible says that an argument arose between the two sets of widows. So back then it was two different groups, Grecians and Hebrews. It'd be like if it was black and white now. And the white widows started to say that the black widows are getting more food when they distribute the food than we are. We're being discriminated against. So they called Peter in. Peter, we're having a problem. We need you to settle it. You know how Peter settled it? He said, elect men, appoint men that are full of the Holy Ghost and have them deal with this. We apostles are to be given to prayer and the ministry of the word. Peter realized by the Spirit that that was an attempt to get him out. And I learned a lesson from that. I don't know who this is for tonight, but it'll be for somebody. That when people start, you know, when your ministry starts growing, I'd like you to be on my board of directors. Would you be on my board of directors? No. If you'd like to call me for advice, I'll talk to you by phone, but I don't, I'm not going to attend a meeting and, and go through a thing. I'm not doing that. I have to focus. Paul said this one thing I do. And when you look at people that struggle in life, they're going in nine different directions instead of finding the one thing God called them to do and doing it until it sticks. That after having done all to do, stand. That you keep doing. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. So I'll tell you right in the beginning, every man and woman that's in this building, that it feels like you hit a barrier and nothing's working and the devil's now giving you other detours, that's not how it's going to work. God's going to put a power in you tonight to say, no, I'm going forward and every obstacle and barrier has to clear out of your way. If you believe that with me, put those hands together again and give God another mighty shout. Somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. The devil actually has no successful strategy against a man or woman of God who won't quit going forward. All of his strategies are to get you discouraged or to say, "Ah, what's the use? Believe me, I know what it feels like to get booked to a church on Easter Sunday and stand up to preach. And there's literally six people there. I counted three times. That's on Easter. Up in the middle of nowhere in Proctorsville, Vermont. One, two, three, four, five, six on Easter. They'll have, and you know all the things the Lord's put in your heart. You already have people telling you the day of evangelism's over. People aren't, you got to remember, Jonathan, it's not 1940. People are busy. They're not going to come out multiple nights to hear somebody preach. So you have that ringing in your ear, what people have said. And you know in your spirit what God told you to do. And then as you look out there, you think, you know what? Those people might be right. Six people, all six look disinterested. I had a lady proudly greet me at the door with a nice church dress on. Hello, Brother Jonathan. My name is such and such. I'm the head of the Sunday school department. Sunday school, there's no children. What did you give them for snack? Cyanide? I'm the head of the Sunday school. Well, you've done a great job running off all the children. Makes It's a good way to make easy work for yourself as a Sunday school teacher. Ban children from attendance. And I remember standing up to preach. You know, back then I hardly had any meetings. When I got one, I'd fast a long time and pray, believe for miracles, believe for souls to get saved. You look across, no one's unsaved, no one's sick. Everyone looks bored. You think, what's the point? These people don't even look like they want to be here. Then you hear the voice of the Lord, persevere. Just keep going. This is where you are now, but it's not where you're going to stay. And I tell every man and woman here tonight, don't mind where you are now. Mind where you're going. Because God will never leave you where he found you. And God will never change you for the worse. He'll always change you for the better. If you know that's true, testify one more time. Put your hands together and give that God a mighty shout of praise. Say it so the devil can hear you. Where I am now now. is not where I'm staying. staying. That's why Paul was undiscouraged. Well, we tried to do something in Ephesus, but then, you know, some people split the church. And and so what? So you take the people that are left, like Jesus. When he said, you know, everybody was cool with Jesus until they got into that one sermon. 
anyone that doesn't eat my flesh and drink my blood can't be one of mine. And the people are like, okay, peace. I was with you till the whole eat your flesh and drink your blood thing. What did Jesus do when they went to walk away? Hey, wait, no, you misunderstood. No, he actually looked at the disciples and said, aren't you going to leave too? Undeterred. If you get motivated by what people like and what they don't like, you're going to be in a lunatic asylum. If you go by as a minister about what draws a crowd and what doesn't draw a crowd, <laughs> you'll be in the funny farm with your arms tied behind your back going, ministry, ministry, ministry. Because <laughs> crowds come, crowds go. People cha- the same people that cried crucify him had thrown him a parade a few days before with palm branches. It never got Jesus up. And when they turned on him, it never got him down. When you let God set the mark for your life, you re- hallelujah, you remain undeterred because God has shown you in the direction to go. And you make up your mind, I will not be defeated. I will not give up and quit. He who began a good work in me shall bring it to completion. And he will. I said he will. God will not hang you out to try. He that began a good work in you shall bring it to completion. So why don't you say it again so the devil can hear? Oh, I guess I got a, a coworker tonight. <laughs> say this with me tonight. Say, I'm not staying where I'm at. I'm not where I'm at. Lift your right hand up to heaven and say it with force. I'm not staying where I'm at. I'm, I'm, going, higher I'm going higher and higher, and higher into the presence of Jesus. Now lift your other hand up next to that one and begin to thank God that it's so. That's what his word declares. And he commanded them, be fruitful and multiply. Take dominion over the earth. You're not staying where you're at. This is the lowest you'll ever be. From this day forward, you go from glory to glory, victory to victory, and strength to strength. And and I'll, I'll just tell you this while I'm at it. And if the devil doesn't like it, that's tough luck for him. He picked a bad place to be this week. This is going to be the worst week that demons have ever had in Alaska. I can tell you ahead of time. Fentanyl, heroin, prescription pills, the supply line is going to begin to dry up from tonight. Whatever, listen, whatever demon is in charge of seeing that people have to bury their children at 19 and 23 and get a call from the prison that their 22-year-old son died in prison and now you owe $5,000 to bury the body. That sucker devil that's in charge is going to get put out of business this week. This is not the hour of the devil. This is the hour of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Continuing with tonight's reading. Everybody say, keep going. That's what you do when you, when you hit a barrier. You tell them, no, you ain't taking me out, brother. I'm going forward. Say this with me. Say forward ever. Backward never. Acts 19. So then as he continues in the word, God gave Paul the power to perform unusual miracles. So that when handkerchiefs or aprons that had merely touched his skin were placed on the sick, they were healed of their diseases and any evil spirits came out. A group of Jews was traveling from town to town, casting out evil spirits. But when they tried to use the name of the Lord Jesus in their incantation, saying, I command you in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a leading priest, were doing this. But one time when they tried it, on a person who was actually possessed with an evil spirit. The spirit replied. I mean, you know, there's people who like to dabble in this stuff. I don't think it's on the air anymore, but there used to be that guy, Ghost Hunter, where he'd find haunted places. He'd always say in every show, I'm an eighth degree black belt. When they'd start to hear sounds, he'd get in his position. (laughs) You can't spin kick a ghost, genius. There's nothing for your foot to connect to. Your karate classes aren't going to help. When they tried on a person who was actually possessed with an evil spirit, the demon replied, I know Jesus, and I know Paul, but who are you? Then the man with the evil spirit leapt on them, overpowered them, and attacked them with such violence that they fled from the home naked and battered, which is also a good way to prepare halibut, naked and battered. Amen. (laughs) 
scriptural. The story of what happened spread quickly all through Ephesus to Jews and Greeks alike. A solemn fear descended on the city, and the name of the Lord Jesus was greatly honored. Many who became believers confessed their sinful practices. A number of them who had been practicing sorcery brought their incantation books and burned them at a public bonfire. So I want you to notice that. Paul didn't spend any time you know, standing up on a hill and taking authority over the people that practice sorcery, just preached. Just preached and healed the sick, got people saved. But then it hit a critical mass where it so broke the, the, the power of the devil that had been operating in that region that people just began to come and burn what they had that was related to what the devil had. Can you say amen? That's what's going to happen this week. I can already tell you. And if you watch me on Facebook or YouTube, you know I, I don't get into this stuff. There's some people, they, they know, you know, they like talking about the devil more than they like talking about God. But I felt it last night, I feel it again. That whatever witchcraft is practiced in this area, when people meet to do it, they're going to be able to tell there is nothing backing them. That the spirits that they chant on that are behind them have cleared out. Because light and darkness cannot cohabitate. And darkness doesn't drive out light. Light drives out darkness. I can tell you now, I can tell you now, whatever operation of the wicked and the realm of hell has been in this region, it has already gone off into the sea, into western Canada, but it can't stay in the valley. Many who became believers confessed their sinful practices. A number of them who had been practicing sorcery brought their incantation books and burned them in a public bonfire. The value of the books was several million dollars. So the message of the Lord spread widely and had a powerful effect. So within a few verses, within two years and three months, it's a guy preaching to a handful of people who then splits to a smaller group but as he persevered, the press comes first. The enemy trying to make sure that you know he's not going to give you the ground for free comes first. But as you persevere, God flips the table on the devil. I'm going to tell you right now, if I had stood here in 2015, the second year they had me here, and started to tell you that the day would come when Planned Parenthood began to lose all their funds, and state Supreme Court started to rule that abortion was illegal. I'd have sounded like an insane person. Because back then, you had every faith leader on Twitter and Facebook, we need to pray, things aren't looking good. And you had the devil's crowd bragging about how well things are going. But oh, how the tide has turned. That now, you have those corporations that profit off of the death of the unborn. Corporations that profit off of the drug addiction of the young. They're on Twitter saying, we need help. But they don't have anybody to pray to. They don't have any help. And you have the church now. Now, taking its place where God said in the last day I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Can I, can I tell you something? When I was in New Jersey last year I took my daughter to the beach tide comes in and then the tide starts going out a few hours later and I felt the Lord speak to me as clear as day. You see how once the tide started coming in, it kept coming. But then when it reversed, it didn't just stop. It kept going out. If, you follow, if you're one of my partners, I sent it out in a magazine. The tide has turned. The Lord spoke it to me right then. In fact, while I'm on the subject, I'll just tell the whole thing. I planned a crusade in Asbury Park, New Jersey last year. We were invited, and I planned it for June. Well, I didn't know two things. I didn't know that Asbury Park was, is an LGBTQ uh, city, and number two, I never thought, they thought I was doing it like to assault them, but I didn't know June was Gay Pride Month. As I told you, I was born in 1980. Back then, it was just June. <laughs> every month, every month wasn't some kind of cancer awareness month and gay celebration. They just had months. Pink socks on football players. I came from a different time. So anyway, when I get ready to do the meeting, I start getting texts and phone calls asking me, do you want to cancel the meeting? 
I said, why would I cancel the meeting? Well, uh, you need to see something. There's actually a whole website page that's devoted to shutting you down. And the New Jersey newspaper on the front page, it said, Asbury Park, everyone is welcome in Asbury Park except this hateful evangelist. Me. Who could not like me? Look at my nice suit and I got my hair cut and everything. And then, of course, you know how the media does. They find the meanest picture of you. That they... So that everybody open it. Oh, my, he looks mean. And so they say, they say, well, it's not just the newspaper. There's actually a whole page online devoted uh, to people making death threats against you. And, and it wasn't exaggerated because we actually got a call from the Department of Homeland Security, DHS, not the housing service, the Department of Homeland Security, that just so you know, we're going to oversee security on the first night because there's been so many credible threats against your life that we're going to oversee it. Okay, fine. I mean, I wasn't worried. I've been around people who kill people. They don't warn you on Facebook ahead of time. <laughs> Real murderers don't threaten. They just murder. I learned that watching Forensic Files. Amen. <laughs> With my couch barricaded against the door. So I decided, as they were saying, you know how bad it got? It even said on one of the pages, we found out what hotel Shuttlesworth was staying at and had him kicked out of the hotel when he came to check in. Only problem was I wasn't staying in the hotel. So some poor businessman that shares my last name <laughs> flew to New Jersey and went to check in. <laughs> and there was an angry mob of protesters who forced him from the hotel. Let me tell you, there are so many Shuttlesworths that are preaching. If your last name's Shuttlesworth, you better just get in the fight because you're in it whether you know it or not. <laughs> you think I'm going to check into a hotel under my real name? I'm not stupid. I watched The Godfather a few times and went to Bible college. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, when I heard all that was happening, you know, I thought, because like I was taught in school, maybe I should pray. Well, then I thought, you know what? I'm so confident that number one, God opened this door. Number two, he already said, Deuteronomy 28, if you obey me, your enemy will attack you in one direction, but I will make him run from you in seven. Didn't say anything about praying. And in Malachi, he said, if you're a tither, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. So I thought, what could I do to tick the devil off the most? You know, if, he, if he's threatened my life, probably seeing me kneeling, oh God, if you keep me safe and we, we command angels. I said, you know, it'll probably frustrate the devil most if every afternoon I just take my daughter to the beach and walk her and smile and say, thank you, Lord, for the beach. Thank you for time with my daughter. I'm so unworried about anything that's happening that it's not even worth praying about. I'll just thank you ahead of time that we're going to see people saved left, right, and center. Can you say amen? amen. Can you say a better amen? Amen. And I brought that up because as I was there, that's when I was at the beach with my daughter and watched the tide come in and then the tide go out. And I felt the Lord speak to me then, the tide is turning. And then when I stood up to preach on opening night and there was a counter festival across the way with all the people that were angry about me preaching there and called me, you know, like they call Franklin Graham and like they'd call Billy. You should read the comments under when they announced Billy Graham died. If you went on CNN, on Twitter, uh, let... Evangelist Billy Graham, pastor to the, to the presidents, has passed away at the age of 99. You should read the comments. Good. Never, I hope his son dies too. I'm glad he's dead. All that. You know, it's a different day. It used to be a day if you told somebody you were a pastor, they'd give you half off your dry cleaning. I told my wife, when people ask me what I do for a living, I'm going to just start telling them I'm, I'm an assassin. I'd probably get a better response. I was sitting next to a lady on first class in a plane. She's talking and talking. Drinking champagne, talking. After four hours, she goes, well, here I've been talking. What do you do for a living? I said, I'm a preacher. A preacher in first class? <laughs> yeah, just pretend I'm an assassin. <laughs> a 
preacher in first class. I, this is what she said. I thought you were supposed to give all your money to the poor. I said, I've been trying to give all my money to the poor. It keeps coming back. Because the Bible says, he that turns his eye. Man, I wouldn't matter whether I feel it or not, but I feel the anointing. It feels good. He who, he who turns his eye to, closes his eyes to poverty will suffer many a curse, Proverbs 28, 27. But he who gives to the poor shall never lack anything. God's not asking you to help other people so you can do without. He's El Shaddai. He's got enough to feed a thousand kids a day and enough for a first class plane ticket so that you don't have to land in Hawaii looking like the third guy from the left on the evolution chart. God, God actually doesn't have to take from you to bless other people. God will use you to bless other people and God will keep the blessing pouring out on you and then you'll bless more people and the blessing will keep pouring out on you. I tell you in the name of Jesus, whether CNN likes it or not, whether the Washington Post likes it or not, you are the children of God called by his name and you are blessed. Hallelujah. Did you know I actually never saw the church that you're getting ready to move into till today? But driving by on the highway, I saw that thing. I felt the anointing on the highway. That's how it's supposed to be. Because I've been in a lot of cities where the biggest structure on the highway is a mosque, Hindu temple, in a nation that was founded for the gospel to be preached freely. And people in different cities have stepped back and let a nation, nature abhors vacuum. If we step back, other things move in. But now on that hill, no wonder the devil has his panties in a bunch. Sorry. That one came out before I could stop it. But thankfully, I'm in the one state where talking like that makes the people like you more. Amen. If we were in Massachusetts, six families would have left by now. Come on, we don't need to hear this. We're never right here. How convenient. I drove by that big church on the hill. That's how a church is supposed to look. And I have bad news for the devil. That thing's going to get built from today with ease. <laughs> I actually got ready to, hallelujah. I actually got ready to start praying about it. And I, that's why I brought up this whole story. The same way I felt it in Asbury Park. I felt the Lord speak to me. No need to pray. The tide has already turned. <laughs> hallelujah. Weeping may endure for a night. But joy comes in the morning. That building is going to stand on that hill as a testament to the greatness of God. And it will also stand on that hill as a giant middle finger to the devil. That you might not like the church, but you can't stop the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on, if you believe that tonight, let, let your praise shake hell. Clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God. Come on, give him the highest praise. Let everything that has breath praise ye the Lord. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Shout a living hallelujah. 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 I kid you not, I stood up to preach that first night in Asbury Park, and as soon as I came up to preach, 400 people across the street simultaneously gave me the middle finger. So now when people clap for me like you did, it actually means a lot, because not everybody claps. Not everybody's happy to see you. So what do you do? Oh, man. No, number one, I went to public school, so it's no big deal. I've seen that finger before. Amen. 
The way I acted in Christian school, even then the teachers had to put their hand back down. So what do you do? You get up and do the opposite of what the devil wants you to do. Say, Hannah, I want everybody to know no matter who you are or where you came from, Jesus loves you. Despite what you read in the newspaper, I love you. If I didn't love you, I'd be happy to let you go to hell, but you don't have to go to hell. I came to tell you there's a flood coming, but there's room on the ark for everyone. You just have to get in in time. Then just begin to preach about Jesus and how much he loves you and how he died on the cross. And you started seeing the vast majority of those protesters. Actually, they had a plan. As soon as I started preaching, they blasted on their speakers, Lady Gaga, born this way, and tried to drown me out. But me no stupid. I actually hired the same sound company that Billy Joel uses when he does concerts in the park. So I had like the stack of speakers from that movie. What's the movie, Turn It Up to 11 and Rip the Knob Off? That old rock Oh, you're all pretending that you don't own TVs. That's fine. I'm talking like, I'm talking like, what was it? No, Spinal Tap. That was the one. I had on like, thank you. Somebody pre- at least pretending they have a, they, that they do watch TV. I had a big stack of speakers and subwoofers. And when they started to play Lady Gaga over me, didn't have to pray or ask God for help. I saw the guy in the back give me the thumbs up and turn it up. And people's hair start to wave. We had prayer for the deaf that night, 90% of whom we created. Amen. How many of you need prayer for healing tonight? What? <laughs> Man, it's good to be in Alaska. I forgot how friendly everybody is up here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, most of the crowd goes home after we overmatch the speakers. But you know what I saw at the end when I gave my invitation? People start coming across the road with rainbow Bands on, rainbow bandanas, rainbow shirts, come across. As the anointing rubbed in, then how many of you need to give your life to Jesus Christ? Rainbow bracelet people. And people got saved, stay there all week, pray for the sick. We went through all that stuff. And then, like I'm telling you now, you put up with the test. Life does have tests. But I have good news. School had tests. But that doesn't mean you have to stay in fourth grade when you're 31. Yes, there's tests, but you can pass the test. And I'm going to tell you in life, there's tests, but God will give you power to pass every test. And every time you pass a test, there's a reward on the other side. And this week, this week, you're not only going to pass your test, you're going to taste and see the reward that God has given you. If you receive that, one more time, take 15 good seconds, clap those hands, and give God the greatest shout of praise. Devil is defeated. Devil's in for a bad year. The devil's in for a bad year. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hey, before before you sit back down, can I tell you something? There is not one or two. There are many people that your children that are bound by sin on their way to hell. They're coming home before Christmas. They're coming home clean. No six-year battle with addiction. He who the sun sets free, they're coming out. They're coming out now. They're coming out now. You don't have to put up with the devil's mess. I said you don't have to put up with the devil's mess. He's not over you. He's under your feet. Your children belong to you. I said your children belong to you. Anyway, as I was saying before I got excited, I'm very sorry. (laughs) So then that, that, that meeting closes. And I got this guy call me. Won't say his name. And he said, uh, hello, Reverend. Well, you know, everybody that called me from Asbury Park was against me, mayor, you know, groups, all this stuff. So I'm just ready to like, all right, yeah, what's your name? What would you like? My name is such and such. I'm a lawyer. And I want you to know I've been watching how this city has treated you. And I noticed something. Took you how long to get your permit to do that crusade? I said, "Uh, three months. I said, that's right. I was keeping track. 
And he said, how long did it take the protesters to get their permit? I said, I don't know. I wasn't paying attention. He said, well, I was. They got it in five days, and I did a little digging, and nobody paid any fees, which is illegal. It's classic discrimination that they charged you and let them protest for free and gave them the permit without even a city council meeting. And he, I said, yeah. I said, this is what I said, you know. It's like you're trained as a Bible college person. I said, yeah, well, that's, that's fine. I forgive him. He said, I'm, I thought you'd say that because you're a reverend. And he said, I actually listened to your messages a few nights. I didn't hear you say one hateful thing. I said, well, I appreciate you listening. He said, I know you've forgiven him, but I haven't. Thank God for Italians. Amen. <laughs> Vendetta. <laughs> he said, I'm, I'm getting ready to file a lawsuit against the city for that. And he said, I'm getting ready to file a second one too, and I might file more than that. He said, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to write about what happened, and I'm a contributor for Fox News, and I'd like to put it in the paper. So this guy, that little paper in New Jersey wrote against me, this guy writes a national article, and then starts... Bug in the city still is a year later. I mean, he, I don't know why somebody would get so ticked off on the behalf of someone they never met. But I brought that up to let you know. Christians are professionals because it's human nature to make a note of everything that's against you. Well, you know, this person did this, this person did this, then this person did this. But I'm going to tell you something. When Paul hit opposition, the Bible says that the Lord spoke to him and said, Paul, don't be discouraged, for there are many in this city who are for you. In Nigeria, in church, they call them helpers of destiny. That you don't ever let yourself get so concerned with who's against you that you forget about who's for you. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it a step further than that. Whatever you magnify multiplies. Not only what you focus on with your mind, but what you speak with your mouth. So if you're always saying nothing ever works out, and it's not fair, and they just then it, it'll actually empower your enemy. But the, if you do like Paul did, where they beat you, put you in chains and stocks in the prison, and it looks like everything's for you, but you keep in your spirit. If God be for me, who can be against me? I know my tomorrow is going to take take your Bible and turn to Isaiah chapter three, because people just think you're saying this stuff to be positive, but it's actually in the Bible. And the Bible is the word of God. Amen. Isaiah chapter 3, verse 10. If you would get that video ready, I'm going to play it in just a second, Lord willing. Don't worry, I'll be done soon. Isaiah 3, 10. It doesn't just say in Isaiah 3.10, all will be well for the godly. It says, say to the godly, all will be well. That's a command from God to a minister. Tell the righteous, all will be well. Who has a King James or New King James? Go ahead, Isaiah 3.10. Say to the righteous that it shall be well with them, for they shall eat the fruit of their doing. Say to the righteous. That's, a, that's an order of God to, to a minister to tell the people on God's behalf, all will be well. You will enjoy the fruit of your right doing. The devil, if you read it in the Old Testament especially, the devil always let people plant their harvest. But when they went to go reap their harvest, that's when enemies would come out and take their harvest. But God said, tell the righteous, all will be well. You will enjoy the fruit of your right doing. So I'm going to tell you both things right now. Number one, I wanted to say it because I was about to just say everything's going to be all right, but then you just think you're quoting an R&B song from the 1970s and being positive. I'm telling you on the authority of Isaiah 3.10, every born-again Christian in the sound of my voice, don't mind what's against you. Mind who's for you. Everything is going to be all right. And I tell you a second thing. All the work that you've done, all the seed that you've sown, 
You raise your child in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Looks like they're stolen away. Do everything God's told you to do. Don't see any fruit. I tell you from the one that was there with six people in Vermont staring at me, disinterested. As you keep going forward, everything's going to be all right. You will enjoy the harvest of your labor. If you believe it, shout, I receive it. If you believe it, shout, I receive it. Well, there's Asbury Park. Then we got one coming up in two months in Newark, New Jersey. Tenth poorest city in the United States. And I was believing God for a big thing. When you watch this video, you'll see why the devil worked to try to get me discouraged and quit. I could have been some little punk. You know, we were going to do a crusade in Asbury Park, but there were many death threats. And then the DHS thought it was wise that we just not do it. I don't care what the DHS wants. They didn't call me into the ministry. I never asked them to protect me, to be honest with you. You know, they need something to do anyway. So you might as well look after me. I'm not worried about that. I'm not worried about nothing. I already know from Isaiah 3. My tomorrow's going to be all right. I'm telling you right now, whatever the devil has you worried about, your tomorrow's going to be all right. And on, on a side note, just on a side note, the way you make it be all right quicker is never repeat anything your enemy wants you to say. You ask my wife, she never had to pick me up. She never said, well, what's wrong, Jonathan? You look troubled. I don't know trouble with me. I didn't come to Asbury Park. <laughs> I came to Asbury Park to cause the trouble. Not to be troubled. I'm not anointed to be harassed by the devil. I'm anointed to harass the devil. I am supposed to be a battering ram to the gates of hell, not be ducking devils. Well, amens are getting softer, but whatever. I'm anointed with fresh oil. Psalm 92, that's why that old man that wrote the psalm had enough sense to say, I will be anointed with fresh oil. Not I hope I get anointed, not it'd be nice to be anointed. I will be anointed with fresh oil. Because when God anoints you, the side note I was going to tell you is, don't talk about what your enemy is doing. Don't talk about what your enemy, you never would have heard me repeat to one person. You know, you can raise money doing that. I could have put on Facebook, we have death threats. Here's the post from the DHS. If you guys could give and help. No. You don't repeat what the devil says. You repeat what God says. If I get around to it, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, God told them what to say when they were going into battle. He said, say, the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. Hallelujah. What you focus on with your mind and with your mouth multiplies. You talk about what your enemies doing, it'll get worse. But if you start to speak and declare, the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. I serve a mighty God. If God is for me, who can be against me? My tomorrow's gonna be all right. If you go home tonight, if you go home tonight and start talking like that, your family, a lot of you, is going to think something happened like you lost your mind. There's some people sitting here, and it's not your fault. It's, it's how America is. They celebrate, dep- I mean, you watch American Idol. They can't have one person sing without going through some horror story. This is, this is Jennifer McLaren. She'll be singing tonight. Um, J- Jennifer, how are you? Well, good. On the way here, three members of my family died. And uh, I lost an arm. And, uh, you know, every story. Americans love sad stories. And you can get a lot of people around you that will have sympathy with you rehearsing the same story you've been telling people for the last eight years about how your husband left you and left you with no money. And it's true. And it hurts. But if you're going to come out of it, you have to retrain your spirit and your mouth to say, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Too easy to preach here. Too easy. I don't even feel like I should be paid for this week, but I'm going to deposit the money anyway. What great people. I'm not saying that to be nice. I've never said anything to be nice. I'm telling you, you are great people. In this church, that is full of champions. Current champions, aspiring champions, long-standing champions. People that came in here that you think you're at the end of your rope, when in actuality, God has you right where he wants you to be. 
And even, even people that have had a lot go wrong, that you think, man, I wish I'd have heard something like this three years ago. If you think back three years ago, you'd have left about 15 minutes ago. I don't want to hear that. But sometimes when people get low, that one of the things that left along with all the good things that left is a bad thing called pride. You go preach in prison, nobody even pretends to know anything. They're the most open people because they're at rock bottom. Sometimes when you hit rock bottom, you're more open to say, God, I need help. You know, Brother Schembach used to tell a story. This is a true story. That a man fell overboard on a ship and the mother got the Coast Guard, save my son, save my son. As she's yelling, save the son, they're not moving. Kids struggling in the water, fighting. She's like freaking out. Can you not hear me? Save my son. Guys fighting, getting more tired, fighting more slow. And then all of a sudden, he quits fighting and starts to go under, and she's freaking out. Like, you're going to just let my son drown? What are you nuts? And when he started to go down, that's when the man dove in and carried his no more energy body to the shore. And she said, thank you for saving my son, but why did you wait so long? And he said, we have to wait till they stop fighting and stop trying to do it in their strength or he would take me down and kill me too. And that's what happens with a lot of people. That's why Jesus said, go to the poor, the blind, the halt, and the maimed. Because if you try to preach the gospel, to people that have, you know, I don't even have to be rich. They're like 9,000 in the bank and two cars. You can't tell them anything. I know, yeah. I know. Pastor, we're thinking about coming to your church, you know. Um, we like the music, so we've actually been thinking of attending. Wow, thank you. I'll notify God. I'm sure he's going to be thrilled. God's probably psyched. People start doing things like they're doing God a favor, but when people get, people feel like they can do it, can't help them. But when people realize they've tried everything in their own power and nothing worked, then they become open to say, Lord, I need help. I'm going to tell you something, and you know I'm a faith preacher and a prosperity preacher and anything else they don't like on CNN, also those things. I had a minister call me a few years ago and say, Jonathan, just so you know, you're getting a, a reputation around the country as a prosperity preacher. I said, tell everyone who told you that that it's actually worse than what they heard. What kind of idiot doesn't like prosperity? What do you want, poverty? Let me just tell you, I've been poor, and I've been rich, and rich is better. Can you say amen? Can you say better amen? Yeah, I'm not backing down on the power of God's word. Because that word's going to be the thing that takes you into your destiny. You can't get by on some 40% diluted, cut up, word you need the real thing the strong thing that's what's going to take you where the devil thinks he can put you down for good there'll be something on the inside of you that says I can do all things not in my strength but I can do all things because Christ strengthens say it with me say Christ strengthens me Now lift both hands and just begin to thank God that his strength is coming into you. God didn't ask you to do it in your own power. He'll give you his power. Anyway, I started to say, I'm a faith preacher. So this sounds like a strange thing to hear a faith preacher say. But with all the rules there are on prayer and their rules and they're worth abiding by. You know, don't be a dummy. Just, well, God knows your heart. No, pray to the Father in Jesus' name. Ask what you will. Cut the unbelief out, all that. But I'm going to tell you something. When you give God, you read it through the Bible, Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, God never turned down a cry for help or mercy. And sometime when you're up against it, if you'll go out in your backyard, first look for bears. And then secondly, lift your hands up and say from a clean heart, Father, I need help. I need your help. Why do you think there's such an anointing on that old song? I need thee. Oh, I need thee. Every hour, I need thee. Bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. 
When you throw your whole self on God. That's what Genesis 17 is. And when Abram was 99 years old, Genesis 17, 1, the Lord appeared to him and said, Behold, I am El Shaddai. It's translated the Lord God Almighty, the God of more than enough, and the one I'll tell you that you can also translate it, the all-sufficient God. Do you know what all-sufficient means? It means whatever you need me for, I will be that for you. You need provision, I'm Jehovah Jireh. You need victory, I'm the Lord your victory. You need healing, I'm Jehovah Rapha. You need righteousness, I'm the Lord your righteousness. Abraham, I know you live in a country where nobody likes you and nobody knows me. But if you will serve me with all your heart, I will be your sufficiency and you'll never need any of their help for anything. You know, when that registered in my spirit, I decided to, I decided to start trying it. First time I went to go preach in Central Africa. You have even, you know, even mission. Well, you know, the, it's just the way it works. These places work on bribes, so you have to bribe them. I thought, first of all, I heard Bishop Oyedepo say that he's never paid one dollar of bribe in Nigeria. Because he won't do it. When they say, he says, don't you know I'm a, I'm a minister of the gospel? I'm not giving you one dollar. So both those things. That I don't have to operate the way the rest of the world operates. I go to preach in Central Africa. Get off the plane. Off a however many hour flight. I'm in mean, long flight. Go and this guy pulls me out. I saw him sizing me up while I was in line. And he calls me over. I have a seat in his cubicle. So I sit down. I already know where it's going. Where's the yellow form? Uh, your yellow vaccination form. I said I had to turn in my yellow vaccination form to get my passport stamped, and you know that. Oh, that's going to be a problem. I said, what kind of problem? The kind of problem that ends with me giving you money personally? He said, well, it's going to be $60. I got up and grabbed the desk and leaned over and said, I'm not giving you anything. And then walked away and started to walk towards the double doors that I wasn't cleared for yet. And you know, it feels good when you do it at the time, but then after you take like five steps, you start thinking, what the heck am I doing? You start thinking all kinds of crazy stuff. Like my mom likes that show Locked Up Abroad, so maybe it'll be like a Mother's Day present that her son's starring on one of the episodes. You know, in Central Africa, Jay Sekulow is far away. <laughs> so I'm walking towards those doors, and I hear that guy say, Sir, sir, wait. And I can tell he's coming towards me. So you think, what do you do? Well, I know the one thing you don't do is turn around. So I walk faster. At this point, I'm committed. And I get to the doors that I'm not cleared for and push the brake bar open and walk through, thinking, well, you know, the guy's right on my heels. And I kid you not, this guy's standing there holding a machine gun with a beret. Big old Congolese soldier. Big guy. He has muscles in places I don't have places. <laughs> and so... He looks at me, and I'm thinking, well, this is how it ends. This is going to be the guy that takes me in. I had a good run in the ministry. <laughs> and he goes, his eyes light up, which threw me off. and goes, Brother Jonathan. I said, you know me? Oh, yes. You know, like, like Central Africa, there's so much love when they talk. Oh, yes. I watch you on TV every day. I heard you preaching here. So excited. To, I don't know why my accent started to turn into Dracula. Uh, now you can see why I'm not an actor. I'll just stick with the English. <laughs> turned into Count Chocula at the end. He goes, I'm so excited that you're preaching here. I said, you are? That's great. Tell him to leave me alone. And his eyes changed. Hey! Starts yelling stuff in French. That little guy turned around and ran back to his cubicle. And I went and got my bags because I found something out. Though there can be a test, if you stand up to that test, God has soldiers who know your name. And there's many in this city that are for you. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye, Praise ye the Lord. Say it so your own spirit can hear it. Say, everyone's not against me. Everyone's not against 
See, there's more for me than there are against me. Say it with force. My tomorrow's going to be all right. I cannot be defeated. I will not give up and quit. I'm not giving up. I'm just getting warmed up. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Man, that's how it goes. You don't speak about the opposition? Start talking about God. Turn to 2 Kings real quick. Tomorrow's going to be all right. Say to the righteous. A minister's supposed to tell you. All's going to be well. You're not going to finish like you started. And you're not going to stay where you're at. Everybody in the sound of my voice that's retired, you are officially unretired as of today. God doesn't have anybody here to waste oxygen. You're the smartest you've ever been. You're the handsomest you've ever been. You're the wisest you've ever been. It's not time to sit in a chair and whittle. It's time to get up and fight well in the Lord's battles. Hi, go ahead. Give God the highest praise. Not, not winding down. Shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Turn to 2 Kings. Say it again. Say it's all going to be all right. Say God knows my name. Everything's going to be all right. Now lift both hands and begin to thank God out of your mouth. Everything's going to be all right. 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 Second Kings chapter 6. Verse 13. Go and find out where Elisha is, the king commanded, so I can send troops to seize him. And the report came back. Elisha is at Dothan. So one night the king of Aram sent a great army with many chariots and horses to surround the city. The army's after him. And the report, when the servant of the man of God got up early the next morning and went outside, there were troops, horses, and chariots everywhere. So Elisha's servant, Bible college intern, goes out to get the morning paper, wiping the sleep out of his eyes, bends over and looks up. And there's tanks and armored cars. They didn't send the cops. They sent the military. And he goes, oh, my goodness. And he comes in to tell Elisha, the old man, Elisha, what will we do now? The young man cried. Don't be afraid. Fear not. An old preacher said, I I just take his word for it. I never counted up myself. There's 365 fear knots in the Bible. One for each day of the year. Fear is not an emotion. Fear is a spirit. God has not given you a That's why if you notice Jesus never That's why if you notice Jesus never comforted anybody that had fear. He rebuked fear. Angels never came and said, hey, I know you're afraid, but if you knew how bad it was, you'd be a lot more afraid than you actually are right now. (laughs) Anytime an angel came, anytime the word of the Lord came, how would it start? Say it out loud. Because to open the door for the problem, the devil has to get you into fear. Fear is the anointing of hell. Faith comes from the anointing of the spirit. So you have to start letting your mind ruminate on things and worst case scenarios and what if this happens? You cut yourself on a bump on your neck shaving. What if it's non-Hodgkin's lymphoma? You start thinking like that. You start letting fear come in and it'll open the door to a host of trouble. But if you listen to the words of the old man of God, say it out loud. Now say it with force. Why do you fear not? It's not staying positive. He's going to tell him why to fear not. Don't be afraid, Elisha told him. For there are more on our side than there are on theirs. There are more for us than there are with them. Another translation, there's more with us than there are with them. Man, and I wish I could like physically pound this with a, like a stake into your heart. 
Because you meet most people and Christians are no different. They only know what's against them. And he said this, and then they said this, and they said this, and so, you know, just keep me in prayer. Be no use keeping you in prayer. All you know is what your enemy has said, and you don't know what you have on your side. Can you say amen? amen. I'm not saying this. Do not tune me out, because people, you know, people, they just hear certain buzzwords and get triggered. I'm not getting into the debate on kneeling for the national anthem. I'm just going to tell you something about kneeling for the national anthem. Not on one side or the other. I follow a psychologist named Scott Adams who made a prediction when people started kneeling for the national anthem. He said, if you notice, I'm going to make a prediction at the beginning of the year. Teams that kneel for the national anthem will post a worse than average record than teams that don't kneel. Do you know why he said? Because psychologically, if you see yourself as a victim, you can't perform well. So it's not one's, it's getting you to understand if you go into a match, things aren't fair, everything. It actually will hinder, and you know what he said on the flip side? He said on the flip side, if you take what's called power stances, anybody ever remember the middle linebacker Ray Lewis? Do you remember how he used to come out at every game? He'd be the last one out, the fireworks would go up and he'd... He said that actually helps you do better. So he said, I, that's my prediction at the beginning of the year. Well, he was right. The average is 500. Teams that knelt went 33 and 36 that year. The team that won the Super Bowl that year was the Philadelphia Eagles, and they made a decision to never kneel before the game. And so I'm saying that because you can read the Bible, you can have a zillion people lay hands on you every prophetic conference and me this week and Pastor Daniel twice a week, but if in your mind, you see that everything is stacked against you and there's no way out and life's not fair, you will keep going lower. But on a night like tonight, with the sun shining bright, at 8.30 at night, 65 degrees, with a wind from heaven blowing through, you say, no, I'm not a victim, I'm a victor. There are more on my side than there are against me. If God is for me, Hey! Somebody shout amen like thunder. Shout amen like thunder. Oh Lord, open his eyes and let him see what I see. The Lord opened the young man's eyes. And when he looked up, he saw the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. If you study that story out, it's pretty cool. Because Elisha says, Lord, let him see what I see. And he says, there's more with us than there are with them. So notice when his eyes opened to the spirit, those armies were being helped by demonic forces. And there's more demon-possessed people now than there ever. You don't have to go on a mission trip. God just lit himself on fire on the White House lawn. Never screamed or anything. That's a, you know, you, you listen to CNN. What would possess someone to do that? Listen to the words that come out of your own mouth, genius. <laughs> they don't believe in demons, but then anytime, what would ever possess? So, a devil. Guy laid himself on fire, never yelled. You know, might be carrying passengers. So yeah, the demonic realm is real. And most people will just leave everything in the demonic realm. You know, Brother Jonathan, um, where we live, there used to, we did some digging, we found out that witches used to do stuff on our property. And my, my daughter has seen it, and I've seen it, and we have a picture that moves. And so, okay, great. How come if the Bible says, I'll order my angels to surround you wherever you go? Most charismatic people all have stories about how they've seen a devil and they've never seen one angel. I'm going to tell you something right now. There are demons assigned to thwart our advancement. But there are more for us than there are with them. Yes, there are. There is a motivating factor. There are people driven by devils to sell drugs. You think about it right now. There's people that carry a supernatural passion 
to bring drugs into Alaska and to profit off of people dying. That's supernatural. But there are also a group of people in a room that are filled with God himself, that angels are ordered to protect them wherever they go, that God has ordained that wherever they set their feet, they will be on land that I have given to them. I'm with a room full of people. There's actually enough firepower represented in this room to blow the devils behind out of Alaska permanently. You don't even need everybody to get filled. You get about 12 people in here that get like liquid fire in them. Devil won't know what hit him. Do you mind if I prayed for you in the black shirt? You're not in trouble. Jesus loves you. When I first started preaching, the anointing was on you real strong. It's going to come on you even stronger right now. You don't have to have slippers on. I'm very, I'm very at ease. I just wear the suit to trick people into thinking I'm intelligent. <laughs> Lift both hands, close both eyes. I don't tell people this lightly. This is service number six, and you're the first person I've said it to. But I tell you something that I think you already know. God's hand is on your life. God's going to use you to minister the word of God and to set people free. And even though you're young, I'm going to tell you something. Even your friends that live in a way that's not pleasing to God, even when you would try to kind of hang out with them and do what they did, it never felt right. You couldn't hook in because God's already reserved you to be a rescue agent for your generation. And I don't know your name, but very soon everybody will know your name because God's going to make you great in your generation. I know you thought you were safe sitting back here, but I'm an evangelist and I travel. Amen. <laughs> Jesus, mighty name. He's a good God. I said he's a good God. Though the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord lifts up a standard against him. Everybody say, the tide has turned. He did his best. One more time, say, the tide has turned. Now lift both your holy hands to God and begin to thank him out of your mouth that everything's turning around for your good. God's not going to put a stop to the infringement of the enemy. The tide will turn. It'll start backing out. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I mean, to tell you what I mean by the tide is turned. You look at it like the ocean. It doesn't just stop going forward. It starts rolling back. Before, they could, before the devil could quit flipping out about one state outlawing abortion, another one jumped on. Then another one jumped on. That's called the tide turning. When God says it's over, it's over. It's not just over. It's Boston over. Ova. O-V-A-H. Ova. Every burden that you came in here with, every battle that you've been fighting, as of 8.38 p.m. Alaskan time, that battle has been transferred out of your hand and into the hand of God. And the only job you have now is to do what you're doing. Rejoice and be glad. For the Lord has given you the victory. Everybody say the tide has turned. Turn to 2 Chronicles 20. That church is beautiful. It's a beauty. That's how church is supposed to look. Praise God. I pray they put a layer of 
cedar from Lebanon on the outside and then overlay it with gold. What do you need a church that big for? Oh, this is only phase one. <laughs> Hallelujah. Second Chronicles 20. Say it so the devil can hear. Say I'm on the winning side. And again, he's doing pretty good. Second Chronicles 20. They're faced with a ton of armies attacking them. Everybody say the tide has turned. Verse 18. Then King Jehoshaphat bowed low with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem did the same, worshiping the Lord. Then the Levites from the clans of Kohath and Korah stood to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud shout. That's triply redundant. Loud is loud. Very, or shouting's loud on its own. There's no quiet shout. And the Green Bay Packers score a touchdown. Yeah. So shouting's loud. Anyway, loud isn't necessary. That's redundant. Very loud shout. Why does he have to shout all the time? I don't think you need to do that. It's not important what you think. The Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I don't think you need to do I shouting personally. And I, oh, good. Good to know. Thank you. What book of the Bible did you write? <laughs> Bible commands it. Psalm 150 is not suggestions. Praise ye the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise ye the Lord. Praise him on the cymbal. Praise him on, on the stringed instrument. Praise him with a very loud shout. Those aren't commands. We used to have a black church choir. I lived in Maine. There's no black pe- there wasn't any black people in Maine uh, back when I lived there. Like none. Like less than, less than like 0.1% of the population. So we would have this black church come in with a choir, and they praise God properly. And the white pastor would always say, and I've heard it several times since, isn't it wonderful how they praise God? Oh, I didn't know Psalm 150 was written to black people. I didn't know white people had the option to shut up, and then one group of people was supposed to praise It's just one people got it right, and another people, I don't know what happened. Start shouting, and your parent grab you. "Mm." (laughs) Hallelujah. Mm. Let everything that has breath praise him with everything that is within you. If that's everything that's within you, you're going to die. Have somebody lead praise like they have a blood pressure of three over one. Let's just give him everything that's within us. We magnify your name. (laughs) You people are impossible to offend. Nothing works. I give up. (laughs) The views expressed by the evangelist do not necessarily reflect the views of King's Chapel (laughs) Wasilla. So I want to tell you something. When we get ready to shout, I wasn't raised like that either. I was raised... Where even though the Bible tells you about dancing before, the Bible actually commands dance before the Lord, give him praise. I was raised in a church where they said that you're not allowed to dance unless it's in the spirit. And then anytime somebody danced, they said, that's not the spirit, sit down. (laughs) Trust me, I was raised like that. But at some point, you have to read the Bible with fresh eyes and have no cultural lens on your eyes. And just act like this was written directly from God to you. And one day I made up my mind that when it said, let everything that has breath praise the Lord with all that is within me, I will bless his holy name. I mean, you study it, man. You had David's wife who wouldn't praise God and mocked him for praising God. She got a curse. And you have Hannah that wouldn't stop praising God. And God turned her curse into a blessing. The Bible says if everybody shuts up their praise, I will cause the rocks to cry out. 
The only thing that God can't do for himself is thank himself and praise himself. So the Bible says that he gave us our primary purpose, that we are here to show forth the praises of God. And when you begin to do that, listen. When you pray, when you pray, angels attend to your prayers. When they prayed for Peter in prison, an angel was dispatched to break him out. But when you praise, Psalm 22, 7, he abides in the praises of Israel. That angels attend to our prayers, but God attends to our praise. And we are a very peculiar army because of faith. We don't wait till the battle's over. We shout ahead of time. We give God the praise ahead of time, and we don't even have to fight. Hallelujah. Watch what happened. Then King Jehoshaphat bowed low with his face to the ground. And all the people of Judah and Jerusalem did the same, worshiping the Lord. Then the Levites from the clans of Kohath and Korah stood to praise the Lord God with a very loud shout. And God said, guys, it's not important to do it loud. It's a bit, no. Early the next morning, the army of Judah went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. On the way, Jehoshaphat stopped and said, Listen to me, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Believe in his prophets, and you will prosper. After consulting the people, the king appointed singers to walk ahead of the army, singing to the Lord. What a weird army. Who would want to be in that band? Can you imagine getting deployed to Afghanistan? Can I have an M16, please? No. Here's a trumpet. I don't want a trumpet. I want a gun. Nope. Praising him for his holy splendor. And this is what they sang. Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. Hallelujah. That's all they sing. Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. At the very moment, they began to sing and give praise. Right when they started, the Lord caused the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir to begin fighting amongst themselves. Can I tell you something? That's what you're going to see. That's what you're seeing happen now in America. It's what you're going to continue to see happen. Is that the enemies of the church and the enemies of freedom are actually starting to turn on each other. They're going to start to sue each other and fight each other. They can't even hold political rallies. Snatching the mic out of people's hands and yelling at them. The camp of the devil is going to get confused. The wheels on Pharaoh's chariots are going to fall off. Hallelujah. The enemies of the church are going to turn up missing because God's people shall not be defeated. They began fighting against each other. And they killed every one of them. After they had destroyed the army of Seir, they began attacking each other. So when the army of Judah arrived at the lookout point in the wilderness, all they saw were dead bodies lying on the ground as far as they could see. Not a single one of the enemy had escaped. King Jehoshaphat and his men, they were going to the biggest fight of their life. When they got to fight, there was nobody left to fight. I had a guy who was a district attorney, I won't say in what state, didn't like that I was in his area, and uh, I won't go into the whole story, but he, he wanted to get me put in jail, so he drummed up some charges, he called me up and told me he was going to see me brought up on charges, I never heard that, never know class for that in Bible school, I was 26, uh, one year married, felt like sick to the pit of my stomach, because when I called the pastor, he said, yeah, that guy is the district attorney, That's not, that guy's not lying. So I hung up with him. I thought, what am I going to do? So I called my Uncle Ted. How many of you were here last night? It's good to have a prophet on your side. I called him up and told him what happened. I said, I don't know what I'm going to do. This guest said he's going to put me in jail because I laid hands on his daughter, and he said that's physical assault, and I didn't have his consent. He wasn't in the church. Somebody invited his daughter to the church, and he didn't like people like me. Fool of the devil. His daughter actually got healed of the problem she had, and he still wanted to. That's how much some people hate God. So I pour out my heart to my uncle. I don't know what I'm going to do. Will you pray with me? 
He said, I'll pray with you, but I'm just going to tell you up front, you will never hear from him again. Well, you hear him say at the time, it's like, uh, okay. I think I'm going to hear from him. But I had enough sense to say, praise the Lord. Then he prayed with me, and then he gave me some instruction that actually this attack of the devil has nothing to do with you going to jail. It's to try to put fear in your heart to quit your ministry of the laying on of hands. So tomorrow night, preach on the laying on of hands. Line everybody up in the church. And if you were here last night, I haven't stopped in 12 years since. Whatever the devil doesn't want you to do, do it all the time. I've lined people up and laid hands on them so much. When my daughter was one and a half, the waitress came to our table and said, aren't you cute? What's your name? And Camila looked at her and slapped her head. Do you know what? She wasn't hitting her from watching me. She thought that's how you greet people. Hello, 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 hello. So, whack. You'll never hear from him again. You want to know what happened? Well, I'm going to know I'm wearing pinstripes, but it's not jail pinstripes. I actually never heard from him again. Stayed there all week waiting to hear from him. Never heard from him again. Do you know why the Lord quickened that story to my spirit? Anybody that's harassing you legally... Any other way, I tell you tonight, anybody that wants this word can receive it. So you can sit there like a ward on a pickle, or you can lift your hands in heaven. Whoever has been dispatched from hell to cause you problems and shut you down, I prophesy in the name of Jesus, you will never hear from them again. Verse 25, King Jehoshaphat and his men went up to gather the plunder. They found vast amounts of equipment. Everybody say equipment. Clothing. Clothing. Everybody say clothing. Clothing. And other valuables. More than they could hold. Everybody say more than I can hold. hold. Hallelujah. (laughs) More than they could hold. El Shaddai. God of too much, God of more than enough, God of the overflowing cup. Hallelujah. Not the God that has you scraped by. The God of more than enough. The God of surplus. The God of abundance. That's coming your way. You are the sheep of his pasture called by his name. More than they can hold. Ever say more than I can hold. There was so much plunder that it took them three days just to gather it all up. On the fourth day, they gathered in the Valley of Blessing, which got its name that day because the people praised and thanked the Lord there. It's still called the Valley of Blessing today. Then all the men returned to Jerusalem with Jehoshaphat leading them, overjoyed that the Lord had given them victory over their enemies. They marched into Jerusalem to the music of harps, lyres, and trumpets, and they proceeded to the temple of the Lord. Now check this part. When all the surrounding kingdoms heard that the Lord himself had fought against the enemies of Israel, the fear of the Lord came upon them. So Jehoshaphat's kingdom was at peace because the Lord had given them rest on every side. Leave that part up so I don't forget it. Everybody say rest on every side. Now, here's what I want to show you. Number one, they were, gonna, they were geared up for the worst fight of their life and instead God just cleared them out. The way they triggered God to do it, praise provokes God to destroy your enemies. Thanks for like 13 amens. I swear, swear, some people just want enemies and like to have problems. They don't like the enemy being destroyed. I know they're my enemy, but they're actually pretty nice. He has a golden retriever. If you like having an enemy slap you around, then you'll have an enemy slap you around. I brought up Brother Shambach in the beginning. He tells that story about the bully he had going to school in Pennsylvania as a skinny kid. And one day when he had enough, he lit into that guy and a fear swept through the whole class and nobody bothered him again. As long as you're willing to let the bully kick you in the shin on the way into the bus every day. He'll do it every day. But on a night like tonight, when God puts a fire in your belly, I don't see why I should have to put up with this one more day. I have the victory. I have dominion. And now I'm going to launch it in to the realm of the natural. And And the way you launch it into the realm of the natural is by praising God. 
Praise provokes God to destroy your enemy as they leave that up. So what happens? Not only do they not have to fight. Everybody say the tide has turned. They spend the rest of the next three days gathering up all of the blessing. I'm trying to. Oh, wait till they're done shaking hands. They spend the next four days gathering up all the wealth. Can you say amen? amen? So not only did God destroy their enemy, they actually had the curse changed to a blessing. Can you imagine going to, to ascend that hillside and you're ready to fight? And I hope we may, And everybody's already dead. And there's just clothing, equipment. You know, I used to preach this stuff when I was in my 20s. It didn't mean as much to me because I didn't need any equipment. I worked for my dad. He bought all the equipment. But now, now I need equipment. And God, I found out that same God never went out of business. He knows how to get you equipment for a well digging company. He knows how to get you equipment for your building company. He knows how to get you equipment for your septic company. He knows how to get your trucks for your employees. He's not a stupid God. He is Jehovah Jireh, the God that supplies all your needs. Everybody say equipment. I'm telling you, I'm having such a rush of testimonies flooded into my spirit that I'm just, I'm going to either, I'll just talk like four times speed. My dad made $4,000 gross income his first year in ministry. Total income with me, my mom and me. And it's time to clothe me for school. It's not even money to buy the gas to go buy the clothes. We're leaving church one day and this lady calls my mother over. I remember this. It's like God never allows the spiritual things that happen to dim from you. I remember this from being six or seven years old. Judy, come over here. My son Joshua is the Moyer family, Sherry Moyer. My son Joshua is a year older than your son, and I was just thinking they're about the same size, or your son's the same size he was last year, and I just felt yesterday, and I had nice clothes. So it wasn't like, you know, my mom had me come in there, I was all scuffed up like Linus from Snoopy. <laughs> well, you know, you have an older crowd when that many people get the, the Snoopy joke. <laughs> Hasn't been on the air for 25 years, but whatever. <laughs> she has two trash bags. They're, they were a well-to-do family. Gave me Ralph Lauren clothes. It was, I still remember it was almost all Ralph Lauren pants, Ralph Lauren shirts. I went to school decked out by my God. I'm going to tell you, for all the people that knock prosperity and blessing, it did something for me as a little boy to see how every time our back was against the wall, money come from, I remember my, hallelujah. He, he's too good. Amen. Hallelujah. He's too faithful to fail. I, I remember my dad going overseas to preach. He left my mom with all the money, which was like no money. And he basically went with nothing. Now, I won't tell you the testimonies that happened to him overseas to get him home. But I remember after church, we went to the um, D Dairy Queen that also, I don't know if they still serve food, but this one served food and ice cream. So my mom goes to take us through the Dairy Queen. We're going to get like one meal and split it, my sister, me, and her. Hallelujah. <laughs> when I hear people knock prosperity, I think of these stories and feel like knocking them. Yeah. We think it was the devil that fed me, you idiot. The God that brought ravens to Elijah twice a day. He has not changed. <laughs> Hallelujah. Too much. Too much. Hallelujah. If... If God never did one other thing for me, I owe him such a debt for the first 38 years, I'd never praise it off. <laughs> Too much. Hallelujah. 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 <laughs> 
What a great God. Too good. <laughs> If he spared not even his only son, how much more will he give us all these other things? We, we order at Dairy Queen, go through the window to pick it up, and the guy that owns the Dairy Queen is a Christian and knows who my mother is. And so, isn't, your, isn't Tiff on a mission trip? Oh, we heard about that. We think that's great. Listen, they give us like sacks of burgers. And fries. I'm like in, in like in like the bags that you throw them away in. More than you can carry. Exactly. More than you could hold. You know, God, God's God. God is in the ridiculous blessing business. Oh, one lady, a six-year-old boy, and a three-year-old girl. How does fifty-eight burgers sound? In a trash bag of fries. And like 30 cups of soda to take home. Just drive home. I'll tell you, I remember that I was a little boy. And those kind of things made it to where I just got a disease that I can't get worried. Because whatever, you realize that God knows you. He knows where you're at. He'll locate you. He'll bless you. He'll open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. That's so great. I booked three of those outdoor crusades. It took all my faith to pay for one. Now I got three coming up just because I felt led to do it. Did you feel led to do it and do it? But then you get it back over oh, in the world. Am I going to get the money to do that? And I'm praying and fasting and, and like nervous. And I'm preaching in Finland in a church of less than 200 people. And they say, would you like to know what the offering was tonight? Sure. 1,083,000 euros. And I'm kid you not. I said, like, I, I mean, when they said that, it sounded so stupid. They thought, These people don't know how to count. You know, I've been doing this for a few years. I know roughly about how much is supposed to come in. And with 197 people, it ain't 1,083,000 euros which was like almost 1.2 million U.S. So when he said that, I said, I just said, like, you know me, you heard me been talking for two, two days. I said, do you have um, adults count the offering or do you have your children's church count the offering? <laughs> and he had tears in his eyes and it wasn't even his money. He said, no, I'm telling you, if you want to know what happened, there was a lady that left her husband. He's telling me, I don't know any of this. I'm just preaching to all these people in a foreign country with an interpreter. There was a lady that left her husband for another man. She wouldn't even return his text messages. And she heard you preach, came to the altar crying and got saved, went back and dumped her, her boyfriend, came back to her husband. He rings the doorbell. When he opens the door, the wife that won't return the text is on her knees crying, saying, I'm so sorry, please take me back. And he wants to know what the heck happened. What got into you? You won't even turn, return my text? Now you're begging me to take you home? What happened? Well, this skinny American came, and he, he just started shouting, and it was a weird kind of shouting, because as he shouted, I felt good, but also bad at the same time. So this guy that's a billionaire that had developed one of the top 10 apps on planet Earth at the time, never gets saved. I don't even know what he looks like to this day. Comes and sits in the back Thursday night, sits in the back Friday night to see who this American was that screamed at his wife till she came back home. And on the last night when I took a six-minute offering, basically a message entitled, Give or Don't. <laughs> that, that guy puts a, the unsaved... To, you know, all I talked about was giving an offering to honor God for whatever he's done in your life. And he, I said, and do it at whatever level you're at. So he writes a thing for a million euro on his credit card and puts it in. And I know enough, anybody, Pastor Daniel would back me up on this. I didn't praise God then because it didn't clear. But when it cleared, <laughs> I'll tell you what. When you pull up your online bank statement on your phone one day, 
and it's like 9,000. Then you pull it up the next day, and it's 1 million. I know they say money doesn't make you happy. But I'm going to tell you, when you see a, a two sets of commas on your balance, you can't even help it. Just there going up. I never, I never had, I don't know at that point if I ever had had, I don't know that I ever had more than a quarter million in the bank. Now I have a million. Do you know what it's like having a million in your account? You go to Taco Bell, you say, can I have a chalupa? And I'd like it with sour cream. They say it doesn't come with sour cream. You say, can I have it anyway? They say, that'll be $1.79 extra. You say, that's okay. <laughs> that's what it's like. I, I can swing it. You go to Buffalo Wild Wings. You say, I'd like an order of wings. Would you like ranch or blue cheese? I'd like one of each. No, that's a dollar extra. You say, that's okay. <laughs> Amen. Amen. In fact, if any other people in the restaurant would like an extra thing of ranch, you can send the $7 bill to me. <laughs> so when I preach on this out of Second Chronicles 20, about going from getting ready to fight a battle, to the Lord. You know what's funny? You get what you say. Remember what we said in Isaiah 3, 3.10? That a man will enjoy. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, a man's belly will be satisfied by the fruit of his lips. When I would preach on Deuteronomy 28 and this passage, 2 Chronicles 20, I would preach on how it said, like my sister read it, more than they could hold. I would say, God will give you so much. He said, see, if I won't open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing so great, the only problem you'll have is not having enough room to take it all in. You know what I said one day? Because, you know, you, you start saying crazy things when you're drunk. Drunk in the Holy Ghost. I said, the day will come where the Lord will give us so much that the bank will have to call us and ask us to not use the small branch that we use and come to the main branch. And when I would say that, you have to remember, people aren't like you in Alaska. They weren't born with personalities. They're not happy in church. And you're watching and you know it's true. You guys are awesome. But when I would say that in the other places, they already didn't even like blessing. So then you start making it specific that one day there'll be too much for my bank. You'd have people, I mean, like all the Botox went out of their face. But there's, hallelujah. But thank God we're not one of those churches tonight. Thank God we're at King's Chapel, Alaska, with a Holy Ghost-filled pastor, Holy Ghost-filled pastor's wife, Holy Ghost-filled people that know their God have become strong and will do exploits in his name. If that sounds like you, let God hear you tonight. Clap your hands one more time. And give God the highest praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody say, more than I can hold. More than I can hold. Say, more than, I can hold. more than I can hold. We go to deposit that money in our little branch, and we get a call. God will give you what you say. And it's very hard in this area to pastor and churches don't grow here. You will die along with everybody else. Do you know the only punishment the 10 spies got? Numbers chapter 14, I will do to them the very things they said in my hearing. They said, we'll die here in the desert. We'll be food for the animals. That's what's going to happen to them. But Joshua and Caleb, God said they have a different spirit in them. What was the spirit? It's the spirit of faith. Faith didn't deny that there were giants, but faith said, yes, there are giants in the land. But if the Lord is with us, but if the Lord is with us, they are merely bread for us. Let us go at once and take the country and possess it from Jordan to the sea. You know, when you prophesy something as an evangelist, you like to say in the next eight days because you're leaving in six that way, if it doesn't come to pass, and somebody writes you and says, you're a false prophet, you can just write them back, I'm not even a true prophet. I'm an evangelist. Amen. 
But I'm going to tell you, I see this meeting being double tomorrow. I see this crowd being the day crowd at noon. I see 7 o'clock, the Lord rounding up people from all over the valley. Word getting out and people driving in. I see the Lord shaking this building in Jesus' mighty name. I see this revival going to level 11 tomorrow night in the name of Jesus Christ. It's not going to take all week. We are going to rock the gates of hell from now through Friday. I can have what I say. And I don't want any empty suits. I want the day to come in America where it's routine, that if you come five minutes late, they tell you to come back next week. It's going to happen. In this country, it's going to happen. The, what was the largest church in Seoul, Korea? Young E. Cho made an announcement to his 50,000 seat church. If you came this week, please stay home next week so that the other people can come. 50,000 seater. But you got a million members. You have five services on Sunday. Psst, do the math. Ain't enough. That the day will come, not how can we fill it. Please stay home. Watch on TV so that other people can come. You think God is only God in South Korea? South Korea didn't have a church of 100 people when he got started. God just needs somebody that will take his word literally. You know, the great Bible scholar, Finest Dake, he had two rules of Bible interpretation. Number one, take the Bible literally wherever possible. Number two, if not possible, search for the literal meaning. If you interpret as a bunch of phrases and feel-good stories, you will have a very ethereal, non-blessed life. But if you start taking it to mean what it said, see if I won't open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that's so great, you'll never have enough room to take it all in then that's what happened. I got a call from PNC Bank. Could you please not use the small branch in your town and use our main branch in downtown Pittsburgh because that branch is not equipped to handle accounts of your size. Let me tell you something. I never got that call before. I used to get the other call. Please deposit some money. We are not running a charity for overdraft people. But the tide turned. And in 2 Chronicles 20, the tide turned. All the enemies died and all the possessions went into their hand. I'm going to tell you for the fourth time tonight, I was going to say final, but I'm probably going to say it one more time. <laughs> Lift your hands all over this place. As of 9-12, Alaskan time, the tide has turned in your life. The problems are disappearing out to sea. And the blessings are rolling in like waves of the ocean. It's not going to be one testimony here, four months later, another testimony. It's going to be surely goodness and mercy. Follow me every day of my life. Imagine if God did something huge tonight. Before you could testify tomorrow at the service, two more things happen. That's supposed to be the order of the day for the children of God. I said that's going to be the order of the day for you and for your family. You're not like everybody else. You don't have to live like everybody else. God has numerous limitless blessings in heaven with your name on them. And with your hands up as you worship them out of your mouth, you begin to call them down. Your enemies start to get rolled back and people that are sent to help you start to roll in. That's what's happening right now in the name of Jesus. Yes, there are some against you, but there's more with us than there are with them. This lady in row three, blue shirt, just stand up and step into the aisle. Lift both hands. Close both eyes. As you do, the power of God comes upon you. Every burden that you've carried for so long, you don't even feel it anymore. The Lord lifts those burdens off of you. And the yoke shall be. So I'm going to finish the way it started. I said it's not going to finish the way it started. So if you take a knee, nothing's fair, nothing works out, that's how it'll go. If you stand up and say, I'm more than a conqueror, you know, 
I'm not denying that there's a system that's stacked against the common man. Any dummy knows that. Problem is, me no common man. Me anointed. Me got Jesus on the inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. Say it so the devil can hear you. I'm not like everybody else. I ain't going to live like anybody else. I'll tell you this last thing and then I'll pray for you. And I'm saying this mostly for Pastor Daniel because when I was praying and getting ready in my room, this is what came to me. Cool story. Because you get locked into this mindset. It's like when one enemy rears their head after another, it's like, well, now what? But then God will start sending people. And they're better than the people the devil sends. God will send anybody. God will use anybody. That's what people don't understand about Donald Trump. And he's Christians like it. God will anoint a donkey. God doesn't need you to be perfect. God will use anybody to get his will done. King Cyrus on down the line. Can you say amen? amen? So check this out. My Uncle Ted feels God speak to him. How many of you heard last night and saw the video of my Uncle Ted? When he was starting off in the ministry, the Lord spoke to him to put his tent up in, in Providence, Rhode Island. And so he's preaching there. Everything's going great. And then one of the state senators comes and says, Hey, Reverend, I hear how good your meeting's going. But you don't want to be here in this bad part of town. But he didn't put his tent up there for fun. The Lord spoke to him to put his tent up there. Don't put it up here. The high school just built a new football field with new turf. Put your, put your tent up there. It's a better area. So my Uncle Ted, very politely, no, I appreciate that, but the, the Lord, you know, I feel to have it up here. And when he said that, the guy got mad and stormed out. Well, then, that, then he sends a delegation back that we've yanked the permit for your tent meeting. He got everything in order, and then they pulled it on him. And so when my Uncle Ted gets that news, he's under the tent, just sits down and starts to pray. Father, you told me to be it. I don't know. The guy pulled the tent. The permit, do you want me to come and hold the meeting anyway and go to jail for having an unlawful assembly? What do you want me to do? Before he can barely get started praying, a car pulls up, and a guy that looks like an extra on the Soprano steps out of the car. <laughs> Half-zipped, velour track suit. And he's mafia. Like, you know, Providence, Rhode Island, up until John Gotti blew it for everybody, there was an operational mafia, especially in Rhode Island, Federal Hill. So this guy gets out. Are you the preacher? So my Uncle Ted thinks, great, I'm in trouble with the state senator. Now I got organized crime. <laughs> Feels like it's just getting worse. This guy, excuse me, are you, are you, no, you know, he's Italian. Are you the priest? My Uncle Ted said, I, I'm the minister. The guy said, um, or no, 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 let me back up. Before my uncle lets him know he's a preacher, he comes under the tent. This is why the mafia guy came. He said, what are you guys doing under this tent selling mattresses? Because, you know, you see a tent up, people weren't preaching like, like now. So people like him just assumed they're holding some kind of flea market sale or something. And he came to get his cut. So my Uncle Ted said, no, I'm a minister. I'm not here selling mattresses. I'm here preaching the gospel and praying for the sick every night. The guy's eyes go, oh, I, I don't know. I'm sorry, Father. And then he asked him more questions about what he's doing. And the guy's like, that's great. And my Uncle Ted, you know, I don't, did it just... Normally, you don't confide in people like this, your ministry problems. But he said, actually, it's not great. He said, why isn't it great? He said, I just had one of the senators come and tell me that I have to shut the meeting down. The guy goes, what did he say? And he tells him, what's his name? He said, don't worry about him. He doesn't run this city. I run this city. He works for me. Then he says, I bet I know why I told you to shut down. Hold on. And he goes to a house across the street from the tent, project house, and then comes back out. He goes, yep, what I suspected is true. They sell drugs out of that house, and he gets a kickback from the sales. And ever since you've been holding this meeting here this week, nobody's been buying drugs from there, and they've been coming to your meeting. Keep doing what you're doing, Reverend, and you won't have any problems with him anymore. God will use a donkey. God will use angels. 
God will use a king. God will use Tony Soprano. God will use Tony the Tiger. God will use any means necessary to make sure that you cross the finish line and get the prize. Want to hear the rest of the story? That night, my Uncle Ted gets up to preach. And just like the mafia guy guaranteed, nobody came and shut him down. And then it got better. Limousine pulls up. Mr. Soprano gets out with two hookers on each arm. I mean, that look like Hollywood central casting hookers. Chomping gum, hoop earrings, leopard print skirt, high heels. They walk right down to the front row with one on each arm like he's going to a prize fight. And sits on the front row, sits on the edge of his seat. And when my Uncle Ted gives the invitation to get saved, he lifts his hand first and comes right up, gets to the altar, looks on either side of him. Nobody came, turns around, sees the two girls chomping gum and in front of everybody, grabs both of them by the arm and says, get up here. You need to be here worse than me. And everybody else came to the altar. Let me tell you something. If you do ministry right, you don't ever need a sabbatical. You don't ever need to get depressed. You don't ever need alcohol. God has a funny way of making sure the devil may have laughed first, but you will laugh last in the face of every enemy. Stand up on your feet, everybody. As you do, give God the highest praise that you've ever given anybody. Come on, take 20 seconds. Let the devil know that you know that you already have the victory. Let me have the band quickly come up to the stage. I'm going to close it right. At the very moment they began to sing and give praises to God, the Lord sent ambushments against the enemy. Paul and Silas were in prison. They prayed. Nothing happened when they prayed. And, everybody say and. and. Sang praises unto God. And the other prisoners heard them. They were in the inner prisons. So that'll let you know how loud they were. Because they didn't use sheetrock back then. My friend in the third row. You. My friend. The one I like. Come right out. Take a step out. Put one hand on your one side and one hand on your other side. Right here. Underneath your hands, the Lord is going to take out the two old kidneys and put in two brand new kidneys. You will not spend these years on dialysis. You're going to spend these years up and about enjoying the blessing of God. How'd you like a couple more things? Pancreas. You get a new pancreas and two new kidneys. All your blood levels come to normal. You're not going to die. You're going to, there it is. it's unscriptural to be sick is that it's impossible to be sick without it eating at your money. It's a devourer to be on kidney dialysis. It's unscriptural. You watch what happens when, when we're about to, I don't know if you caught the message, but we're doing praise. Amen. I know, I know there's like a rule book somewhere that every service has to be closed with a slow song, but we're going to close shouting tonight. Can you say Amen. Have a drummer, please. I'm going to have you guys just pick a chord, and on the count of three, I'm going to have you hit it and make sure it's a, it's a major chord. And we're going to give it a blast. And if you wanted me to pray for you tonight, tough luck, because I'm going to teach you something to do when I'm back on the lower 48. 
which is how to lift up your own hands and shout unto God with the voice of triumph and provoke God on your own into your own situation. Yes. Smile first. There you go. Hallelujah. Let the redeemed of the Lord. I'll pray for one more person and then I'll leave you alone. My friend in the third row. Strike the shirt. Yeah. Come right around. both hands where you're at. I don't know you, but the Lord knows you. You've been carrying the load of like three people for so long that you can just do it now. But when the Lord lifts those loads off you, you're going to realize like you're going to hear the birds sing in the morning for the first time. Just catch yourself laughing to yourself. You will no longer wonder how to get it in. You'll wonder where to put all that's come in. The same way my mom was trying to figure out how to buy me clothes and then had to figure out what to do with two trash bags of clothes in a little apartment. That kind of provision is just going to keep coming your way. Lift both your hands all the way up as you do the power of God comes upon you. The burden is lifted off your back and the yoke is destroyed. Well, come on, if you're going to clap, clap. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hey, we don't go by how we feel. But how many of you can actually feel that your problem has already been cleared out in this atmosphere? You're not wrong. On the count of three, we're going to let out a shout that lets the devil know that he's going to have a bad time in the valley. That there is a group of people in here who know their God, know the weakness of their enemy. Don't let anybody do your praising for you. Don't let anybody do your dancing for you. I want you to praise God on the count of three. Like if, like if one person was going to get God's attention. You are going to be that fellow that God tells the angels to hush up for a little bit to attend to you. Are you ready? Are you ready? Before I count to three, please see it this way. At the moment they began to praise and sing praises unto God, the Lord stepped in. So this is not some kind of fun thing we're doing to close the service out. See your praise as provoking God to destroy everything that's aligned against you. Can you say amen? So on the count of three, we're going to let out a shout. I'm not going to cheerlead you. I'm going to do my own praising. On the count of three, give it a blast on the drums and everything else on the count of three. Ready? One, two, three.
every hand lifted to the Lord. The battle is over. The victory is yours now. God has stepped in and everything that's not of God must step out. I thank you, Father, for a supernatural acceleration of your plan and purpose for this church, for our lives, in Jesus' name. No more struggle, no more tears, no more sorrow, no more death, no more pain. For the old order of things is gone forever. And pray that my will that is done in heaven be done on earth. Receive your victory today. I said receive your victory today. In Jesus' name. Every head bowed, every eye closed, you can put your hands down. The Bible is very clear. Only the redeemed can praise the Lord. Until you give yourself wholly to the Lord. It's just you shouting along with other people. But God passes on receiving your praise. Only the redeemed can praise the Lord. Only those that have given their life to God. Like you just gave up worship out of your mouth and with your hands. The first thing that must be presented as worship to the Lord is you. I give you me. Jesus didn't come down on earth, to the earth and sing you a song. He came down and gave him so that you can have life and have it more abundantly. If you're here tonight and either you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you're living like they live on the, in the world, on the E channel, whatever. Nobody's going to have a problem with you not living for God. They'll celebrate you for it. But God is looking down from heaven, saying, Be holy, even as I am holy. For without holiness, no man shall see God. And then secondly, maybe you went to a VBS when you were 8 or 11, gave your life to the Lord, you were raised in church, but you fell away. Don't listen to these backslidden people on American Christian television. Once you're saved, don't worry, everything's fine. If that's true, why did Jesus write a, a letter to seven churches? Yes. And five of the seven, he warned them. Yes. Make sure, take heed of what you're doing, that no man take away your crown. Yes. God will never cast you out, but if you want to duck out on your relationship with him, God will never force anybody into heaven or force anyone to love him. And if you like five of those seven churches he wrote to, as Jesus has waited his coming so that more people have time to hear the gospel and get saved. But during that time of waiting, you fell away. Now you're living like normal Alaska. And I'm only picking on Alaska because I'm in Alaska. If I was in Pennsylvania, I'd say normal Pennsylvania. It's normal to smoke weed, normal to have sex with whoever when you feel like it. Nobody will say a thing. God has a standard to get into heaven. Do not let the backslidden age trick you into thinking you're saved when you're lost. And if in the presence of God, the Holy Spirit's already spoken to you, you need to get rid of this thing. He's not doing it to scold you. He's doing it because he loves you. Sin is a cancer. Either you get rid of it or it will dispose of you. That's why we give an altar call. It's saying, Lord, I refuse to let this thing destroy me and take me to hell. I lay it on the altar. When you give it to God, God in exchange will give you his life and power. If you fall into either of those two groups and you say, Jonathan, that's me. I need to be saved and I'm not putting it off one more hour. I'm walking out of here at 945 knowing my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Some of you will lay your head on your pillow tonight 
for the first time in years or forever with total peace knowing there's not one sin separating you from God and if the trumpet sounds you're ready if you need to do that tonight I want you to quickly put your hand up and wave it at me and we're going to pray in Jesus name I see you in the second I see you God bless you God bless you I see you in the back I see you in the middle I see you on the sides I see you I see you in front awesome very quickly everyone that lifted a hand and meant business with God quickly slip out of your seat and come and join me at the front like my friend did here with boldness unashamed come right now go ahead and clap for them as they come welcome to the family of God hallelujah hallelujah anyone else before hallelujah I don't mean to pick on you, but you like me anyway. Before we even pray, all the damage to your knees and back, your bone structure, your feet, the pain in the bottoms of your feet, you're too pretty to hobble. You will move easy. Do you feel the Lord touching you? Behold. if you would lift both hands to the Lord and say this prayer of faith after me this lady got healed off a walker in West Virginia at the end of last year I don't know if you ever met people from West Virginia on her way out she just took her big walker and slammed it in the trash and a walker doesn't fit in the trash and I felt the same anointing that came on me for that for her if any man be in Christ they're a new creature the entire old life has passed away and all of them becomes new including knee cartilage and everything else with your hands lifted pray this prayer of faith after me say it nice and loud Heavenly Father oh you sound good I've came forward tonight to give you my life forgive me of all my sins Wash me in your blood. I believe in my heart. You raised Jesus from the dead. I confess with my mouth. Jesus Christ is King of kings, Lord of lords, and my Savior. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Fill me with your power. Where I was weak, make me strong. In Jesus' name. Now to say this so every devil in Alaska can hear you. Say, I am saved. I am a Christian. God is my Father. Heaven is my home. My sins are all forgiven. I'll never turn back. God has blessed me. No witch can curse me. I am blessed. I am very blessed. God's hand is on my life. I shall not be defeated. I will not give up and quit. God's begun a work in me. He will see it to completion. In Jesus' name. Lift your hands where you're at. Let me bless you. I bless you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The arrows of the wicked will not harm you. The shield of faith quenches every fiery dart of the devil. None of them get through. You're not allowed to die this year. You live and declare the glory of God while you're yet in the land of the living. I'll tell you some good news. Lift your hands up even higher. As you had faith for somebody else, and the whole time we're believing for God to touch them, once you exercise your faith for other people, God will boomerang it back to you.
You don't have to stop dancing. You can just change partners. Amen. Praise the Lord. Too young to be old. This lady in the blue in the third row. White, white, blue. Just step right out into the aisle. Thanks for coming. Lift both your hands right there. All the way up. Close both eyes. By the way, for all the Baptist people that watch and say he's a hypnotist, no hypnotist ever tells you to close your eyes, genius. I'm telling you, every time I feel that, you go back and watch, I bet you there's somebody typing in all caps right now. One thing I've learned is demons don't know how to type with cap locks off. False prophet. Watch somebody else's Facebook. With your hands all the way up and your eyes closed. That's the fire of God. More, more, more. Here in the, in the green, come right out. Power of God's all over you. Stand right there, it's fine. Lift both hands, close both eyes. And by the way, just to get this out of the way on Monday, my goal is not to make you fall. If the goal is to fall, I'd have everybody lay down at 7 30, get up and dismiss. But people fall when the power, because people are like, I don't want to pray for him, but I don't want to fall. Then stand up. If you get pushed down by somebody as skinny as me, you have a problem. But when God's power hits you, it's very strong. Lift this hand up, put this one on your Everybody that's at the front, welcome to the family of God. Your sins are all forgiven. Just stay right where you're at. I'm gonna give you an instruction. This nice lady, just lift both your hands up. Every private battle that you've been fighting that you've not even told anybody about, you're delivered from it today. Lift your hands all the way up. You'll never dread being in your room by yourself anymore. The thing that was a sign from the devil to torment you, that's why I come. I'm a sign to torment it. Amen. You can tell it's gone. If you're clapping for Jesus, clap like you're clapping for a king. King of kings, Lord of lords, he shall reign forever. I'll tell you what, I was already happy when I came in and this hasn't helped any. Amen. Now I'm too happy. Too happy. My friend in the yellow shirt behind the lady in the, in the teal shirt, just lift one hand up to God, put one hand on your heart. You look healthier than me. You look like you could take me in a fight. Well, I'll tell you, the Lord's going to touch you on the inside. Like roll back the clock like 15 years as a reward for your faith. Be filled. More. There it is. More.
you guys go back to your seat in a second. Let me just say one thing before I, I, I talk to you. For everybody that's watching online, certain things start to irritate you after 17 years. When are you going to be in, in Anchorage? When are you going to get in your car and drive to Wasilla? I, can't, I came 5,000 miles. Try coming 50 minutes. I can't hit every place before Jesus comes back. So when I'm in your state, utilize vehicles or dog sleds, anything you want. Because there's people wondering, is he ever going to come up to get in a plane? and get to the meeting. You won't regret it. Whatever money you have to spend to come here, I promise you, what you get from God's word will overproduce what you spent to come. And when the Lord starts moving like this, I just, I know how things go. Jonathan, I have a sister. Would you come and pray for her? Would your sister come to the meeting? I'm preaching twice a day. We don't come and pray, preach twice a day so that we can run around and visit seven people. Tell people to come. The Bible says in the ministry of Jesus, they came to hear and be healed. People need to hear the word of God. And there'll be a stronger anointing to get them healed in the meeting. That's why we're doing two a day. If you did six a day, can you think maybe you could come by after work? You come here. It, and then you know you'll invite people to the seven o'clock meeting. I don't get off work till eight. I promise you I'll still be preaching at 801. Promise. Promise. Yeah, but I don't have time to get changed first. If you come after installing sheetrock and you're covered in white dust, it's okay. If you're a baker and you're covered in confectionery sugar, it's okay. But those should be the only two white powders that you're covered in. But we won't ask questions. Amen. So don't let any little stupid thing keep you from the meeting. You say, I, I'd love to come to the noon meeting, but I work. Tell your boss you're using all your smoking breaks for the next 10 years this week. Can you say amen? Just get here. You get half an hour for lunch. Tell them you're using next week's lunch too. And that you'll work through lunch. This place was comfortably full today. The weirdest thing I've ever seen. You guys are not like other people. And that's a good thing. You had people coming in at 1252 like packs of people. People just emerging from the forest. I like that. So tomorrow at noon, how many of you are here at noon today? Powerful. We don't have like Coke at night and Diet Coke in the morning. Revival at night, revival late. In the day, we just limit it to an hour so we don't have to pray for everybody to re get rehired on Friday. But we punch it noon to one and then at night, blow it out. You see what this place looks like on Monday? God is moving in Alaska. Tomorrow night and tomorrow day. I'll say this, this will be the first time I've done this in 17 years. We normally have Breakthrough Friday. Tomorrow is Breakthrough Tuesday. We're like what it normally takes till Friday to get. Every issue of concern, everything you're believing for, there's going to be an impartation tomorrow. So don't miss it. Those of you that are at the altar, I want to welcome you to your home. Don't let any Sunday, I'll tell you, a smile like that, I feel paid. Now, you're already healed. All the strength that's in my body, by the grace of God, it flows into your body. Everything that's been tight from not using it, it comes loose. that came here to give your life to the Lord you're as saved as I am don't let the devil play any tricks on you you're, not really, you're as saved as I am if the Pope doesn't get his act together slightly more saved than him amen very saved so now come back tomorrow let God build on what he did today and then bring people you know 
And if you don't have a home church, don't let anything keep you from here on Sunday. If you do have a home church, switch churches. This is where the Lord resides. Amen. Once again, the opinions of Evangelist Shuttlesworth do not reflect the opinions of Pastor Daniel Bracken in King's Chapel, Alaska. But I'll tell you, I go to churches all year long. This is a spec. God's hand is here. If I lived in a Wasilla, I'd be here. If I lived in Anchorage, I'd be here. This is where the action's at. One mistake people make is they don't appreciate a move of God till it's over. You're actually in the middle of one right now. I don't mean just this week. I mean this week is a part of what's going on on that hill. Amen? So I'll turn the service to Pastor Daniel. And he'll give you whatever instructions you need. And then I'll receive an offering after he's done talking to you. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. You all may be seated. We love you. If on your way out you've prayed, if you're up front or you, you didn't come up front, you prayed that prayer and you meant it, you gave your heart to Jesus, we want to be sure to help you grow in the things of God. Uh, Pastor Vince and our, our team, Connect team, will be in the lobby to hand you some material to help you grow in the things of God. Amen. We want to receive an offering so our ushers are going to prepare. Before you give, let me just read these few verses to you. Amen. 9.53, I'll be done before 10. But I want you to hear this. Give me one second on the music. Deuteronomy 26.1. The Bible says, When you enter into the land, the Lord your God is giving you as a special possession, and you have conquered it. Everybody say, conquer it. And settled there, put some of the first fruits of the crop that you've harvested into a basket. Why do they have to pass those baskets all the time? That's even in the Bible. Put it in a basket and place it in the place your, the Lord your God chooses for his name to be honored. Go to the priest in charge at that time and say to him, everybody say, say. say. With this gift, I acknowledge to the Lord your God that I have entered the land he swore to our ancestors he would give us. The priest will then take that basket from your hand and set it before the altar of the Lord your God. I love how Pastor Daniel did that last night because that's scriptural. To come and bring your offering. It's not supposed to be baskets passed because you're kind of ashamed. Of you're supposed to take your best and present it at the altar. Can you say amen? amen? You must say in the presence of the Lord your God, my ancestor Jacob was a wandering Aramean who went to live as a foreigner in Egypt. His family arrived few in number. But in Egypt they became a large and mighty nation. When the Egyptians oppressed and humiliated us by making us their slaves, we cried out to the Lord, the God of our ancestors, and he heard our cries and saw our hardship, toil and oppression. So the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a strong hand and a powerful arm. Whoever did sound tonight, on a scale of one to five stars, seven stars. Thank you very much. I don't know who's on sound duty the rest of the week, but now I do. You are. When the Egyptians oppressed and humiliated us by making us their slaves, we cried out to the Lord, the God of our ancestors, and he heard our cries, saw our hardship, toil, and oppression. So the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a strong hand and powerful arm, with overwhelming terror, and with miraculous signs and wonders. He brought us to this place and gave us this land, flowing with milk and honey. It must say flowing with milk and honey. And now, O oh Lord, I have brought you, this is what you're to say, I brought you the first per portion of the harvest you have given to me from the ground, then place the produce before the Lord your God and bow to the ground and worship before him. Afterward, you may go and celebrate because of all the good things the Lord your God has given to you and your household. Who said hallelujah? You caught it. So then you do that. Every, then it tells you every year the tithe to offer. You must declare in the presence of the Lord your God, again, you got to do it with saying, I have taken the sacred gift from my house and given it to the Levites, foreigners, orphans, and widows just as you commanded. I have not violated or forgotten any of your commands. I've not eaten any of it while I was in mourning. I've not handled it while I was unclean, and I have not offered it to the dead. Everybody say offered it to the dead. 
you don't give to dead places. Well, you know, we give, we give to this church because if we stopped giving there, I don't even know if they'd be able to keep going. Well, then it needs to get shut down. If you're sustaining it and God's not sustaining it, it's already over. You don't give out of like manipulated compassion to some little pathetic church that hasn't won a person to the Lord since 1983. You find where God's moving and you sow where the life of God is. I'm telling you. I used to scatter my seed all over the place. And the last two years, I have been very deliberate about where I give. You find where God is blessing. God told Abraham, I will bless those who bless you. See, you, you don't try to make something happen. You shut, find where God's on the move. Like that church on the hill. You don't have to be a, a Bible scholar to see that God, it is the Lord's doing and it's wondrous to behold. And you sow into it. That's why I brought 10 grand up myself. And ask, ask Pastor Daniel if I've asked him how much, how, which came in the offering last night. Like I'm nervous whether I'm going to recoup the 10 grand. I've been in this thing too long. You put the seed in the right ground. You don't have to worry if the seed will come back. The seed will reproduce 100 fold. When I told that story about the men that developed that app, I felt like the Lord was doing that for people here tonight. That When I said it. You were thinking of, it wasn't a wife that ran away and came back. might have been something else. But you owe an offering of honor to the Lord. You now gave him your praise. Money can't substitute for vocal praise. But vocal praise isn't a substitute for doing what Deuteronomy 26 said. Yes. You, you want to know something? When I gave the 10000 yesterday, nobody had to provoke it out of me. I was the one taking the offering. I thought ahead of time, what can I bring that would represent an offering of honor that's my best. Not everybody can give 10,000, but many can, and many can give more. And many of you know me for five years. The answer to see America changed is the public preaching of the gospel with signs and wonders. And that's what I have given my life to. We're on national, I mean, from when I was here last year. I'm on nationwide television, 12, uh, well, your time, 8 a.m. to 8.30 a.m., Monday through Friday, live. We have Jehovah's Witnesses call in, lots of them. We had a Jehovah's Witness man call in. I never heard anything like that. I'm getting saved, and I'm pulling my whole family out of the church. Yeah. There's easier ways to reach people than riding a bicycle door to door. You can hit 34 million homes in one shot. And have the phones ring off the hook for 20 straight minutes. I need the Lord. Jesus just healed me on down the line five times a week. When you connect your money with that, God will boomerang it back to you. And your original gift doesn't come back. It comes back pressed down, shaken together, running over to make room for more. So I want to challenge you to do something personally. And then if you have a business or a ministry, do something from your business and ministry. The same way you keep God's windows open over your personal life is how you do it with your business. Ask Chick-fil-A. Ask Chick-fil-A if tithing's old covenant or whether it still works today. It's like Brooklyn rush hour traffic in a town of like 1,200 people by the blessing of God. Can you say amen? amen? So just ask the Lord what would represent an offering of honor for you and give it tonight. Don't give little. Give big. Something with your heart attached. And do the third part. When you give it, say something to God. I was a wandering Aramean in a foreign land. I was lost in sin. But you brought me out. And I give this as honor to you that the land of milk and honey that I now enjoy, you're the one that brought me there. And that keeps the milk and honey flowing your way. Can you say amen? amen. Please welcome the handsomest pastor in all of the valley, Pastor Daniel Bracken. Okay, ushers, would you help us? There's four different ways to give. Thank you so much, Evangelist Jonathan. What a powerful meeting. Would you put your hands together for Jesus and just honor him that way, as well as we, as we give. The entirety of this goes to his ministry. You can give online. You can give through the app. You can give uh, all these different ways. Wow, amazing. 12, again, 12 o'clock tomorrow. One hour, exactly, one hour. We'll be back here tomorrow night. Get on the phone. Use Instagram. 
Tweet it. Facebook it. Do whatever he means you can to reach your neighbors. Invite people. Amen. If you're making out a check, make it out to KC. We will send one check on for the entirety of this offering to Jonathan Shuttlesworth. Revival today. Amen. Amen. He has a table out there with all kinds of resources and uh, CDs and these cool um, USB cards that hold like 10 CDs on them. Go resource yourself. Stop by his website. Check it out. A Facebook Live. He's got this, what's his name? Kofi? Kofi? Kofi. Leads a prayer meeting that will just curl your hair if you have it. Powerful, powerful, fervent prayer. You can check on, be a part of that. Tremendous resources. We love you. Thank you for building the kingdom. Amen. Amen. Ushers, would you come? We better put the buckets up front, otherwise I'm not sure what will happen. Hallelujah. You didn't catch that? He talked about passing the bucket. It's not a, not a scriptural thing. It's a tradition we have, but I think it's an honorable thing to put it up front too. So if you're giving on your device, you just come and do what my wife and I do. You could just, because we went through withdrawal when we were, we were giving and the, we lost the bucket. So we just, we would take the bucket now and we just tap it. You could do that too. You can bring your iPad, your computer, tap the bucket if you want to can use uh, an envelope, so on and so forth. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for what you've done tonight, what you're doing all week. We receive the amazing gift, Lord, of this, of this family. We celebrate them. You've raised up this man and woman for such a time as this in America, and you're raising up others, and you're doing something here that's beyond words. We're so grateful. We're so thankful. We are. We stand in awe of your great grace towards us. Set the state on fire. Bring salvation, healing, deliverance. Lord, thank you. We receive the word of the Lord today. And we sow a seed. We give a gift. We pray a hundredfold return. To the gift and the giver in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand up on your feet. Come on up front as we continue to worship. And then we'll close in formal blessing you at the end of our service. Come on. Before we close, and you can keep playing, let me just tell you this. When I was working construction, and we would have these week-long meetings when I was coming up, we would get so touched by God. And yeah, I would feel a little bit tired in the morning, but man, by the time, God, just God's favor, by the end of the week, I found myself free, filled, miracle, power. I'm telling you, sometimes it takes a little bit to just get... Get some hunger for God. Get, get on the phone. Invite people. Let's blow this place up. 12 o'clock tomorrow. Goes to 1. 7 p.m. Facebook. All you out there. Take a plane. Take a train. Do whatever you got to do, man. Come to the meetings. It's going to be amazing. Let me bless you. Father, thank you for what you've done. Bless your people. Cause your face to shine upon us. Lift up your countenance towards us. Be gracious to us. Keep us. And give us peace. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow.